Not quite. There it is. All right. I'm going to present my screen here. So today, we're going to talk about, let me figure out how to do this slide. Uh, there's a present button, I always miss it. Share, view, present, here we go. Sorry, I'm going to the top. All right. So today we're going to talk about Residential Land Development 101. I had a conversation with Betsy a little bit about this a couple weeks ago, and I thought it'd be a good topic for us to explore and learn about. I'll preface by saying I'm not a land developer. Um, I have helped people who are working on this stuff and been in uh, the county meetings where they uh, approve, talk about the zonings and talk about the process and get it, getting it done and all that stuff. So I'm not a land developer, but um, I can teach 101 and that's it. When it gets to 200 level class, I'm not going to, can't teach you. But I think this will at least help you guys uh, learn the basics, understand the lingo in case you ever do come across a client who says, hey, can you help me developing this land? And you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to, you know, navigate that a little better. Um, so the goal is to understand the basics of residential land development. Residential, we're not talking about commercial today. So that you can accurately advise and service a land developer, right? So you can help somebody who is considered a land developer. Now, I'll just preface by saying a lot of people think land developers are builders. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. The so land developer, by definition, is somebody who takes a piece of land, develops it, and then sells it. They might sell lots. Uh, they might sell it. Um, they might build the houses and then sell it. But it's the person who is developing the land, primarily, is what it's what it is. So you got to understand the principle of bulk purchasing. Uh, bulk purchasing. So. This is really basics to economics and any kind of business, but you, you know, I, I use the Amazon logo because I mean, they probably do it better than anybody else, but they have figured out a way to buy a bunch of things very cheaply and sell them for a little bit more, a little bit more. And they actually, you can get them cheaper on Amazon because they have even such a greater buying power than you know, you going to a local store or a smaller website. So the, the bigger the bulk you buy, the more profit you can make on selling the individual things, right? It's like, think about a pizza, a piece of pizza. You, you, you know, make this whole pie of pizza and it costs you whatever, let's say it costs you $3 to make it. You cut up each individual slice. Uh, let's say it's eight, eight slices and you sell them for $2 a slice, $16. And you've made $13 profit, base, the basics of it. That's kind of how it works. Same thing with land. You buy a chunk of land, and then you cut it up, and then the land will generally sell for more per acre the smaller the piece is. It's a very, very important principle to understand because a lot of times we're doing uh, market analysis on land, and we'll say, you know, how much is an acre worth? Uh, how much is an acre worth, you know? Now, there's a lot of factors in that, tons of factors. But if all things are equal, let's say location, let's say the topography of the land, meaning the woods, fields, whatever, all this stuff, if all of the things are equal, but the only difference is the size of the lot, right, then, um, then the price of the, of the land is going to be less per acre, the larger it is. The price of the land is less per acre, the larger it is. So you're buying in bulk, and then when you can cut it up, you can sell it for more. That's the idea. Market analysis and feasibility study. So this is how you provide value as an agent, right? How you provide value as an agent. Market analysis and feasibility studies. Okay, so one, you need to understand your developer's goals. What are their goals? 
Um, how much profit are they hoping to make? You need to know, or do they have a realistic number? Do they not have a realistic number? Uh, what do they want to do? Do they want to sell three hundred thousand dollar houses? Do they want it to? Do they want the neighborhood to turn into a million dollar plus home neighborhood? Um, do they want to unload it in six months? Do they want to unload it in five years? Right? You need to understand all these goals of what they're shooting for, so you can better advise them and help them. Now, if it's a new developer and they they're just getting into this and they think they can unload a development in six months, you probably have somebody that you need to manage expectation with expectations with because typically developments take years to unload these things years uh, a couple years would be pretty fast for a typical development um, but you need to understand your developers goals what's their taste what's their appetite you know so to speak each investor every investor has different appetites right do they um, are they looking for a huge development with you know 100 200 homes are they looking to develop you know, 10 acres and build five homes, you know, what, what is their appetite so you can help them? So you under, need to understand what their goals are. Know the market. Um, knowing the market, let's say they give you a target area that they want to be in. You have to understand the value of the land. And you have to understand the value of the completed house as well, right? Two separate things. You have to understand these future values, future potential values after it's developed so that you can accurately advise them in the best way. Um, you know, there is a, there's a development that I know of that, um, my opinion, I think what happened was the developer wasn't given good advice or didn't plan very well, but assumed that these lots were going to sell for a lot more than they did in the end or that they, he could tr try to sell them for in the end. So, it, I, I think probably what happened in that case and what happens probably many, many times is that they were just given either bad advice or they didn't look for advice. And you as an agent, that's where you can help a developer. The developer is the one maybe with the cash, with the resources, with the means. Maybe they understand road construction costs of that. They understand all the back end of the development. They might be an experienced developer, but where your expertise lies is the value and marketing these products once they develop the product. See, it's two separate sides of the business. It's the developing the product, that's the developer's job, marketing it and selling it, pricing it, that's your job as the agent. That's where you give them good advice. Um, feasibility studies, they can include soil studies, surveys, uh, water sewer access, economic studies, zoning laws. Okay, so soil studies. I think I might have doubled a slide here coming up, but if it is, whatever. Um, but soil studies are things like, um, you know, they they uh, test the dirt, test the soil to see if it can be, you know, a good drain field place there, right? They want to know that if it's in a rural area and you're not bringing in sewer and water, does the, are the, does the land perk, percolate, okay? Does it percolate for conventional systems? That's what everybody wants to know. If you buy a 50-acre tract of land and you're going to develop 50 home sites on it with uh, septic systems and, and the land does not percolate well, you're going to go from $9,000 per lot for a septic system, seven to nine, to fifteen to $25,000. Now, you multiply that over 50, there goes all of your profit right there. So you need to make sure that um, you know the soil is good and it's and it percolates for a conventional system. Percolation simply means that the ground absorbs the water. The rate at which the ground absorbs the water. Pretty much every piece every piece of dirt percolates some, but the question is, does it percolate for a conventional septic system, which is your cheapest route? Surveys, obviously, somebody getting out there and cutting up all the land and figuring out where the lots go and you know how big they're going to be and where they're placed, all that stuff. Water sewer access, talking with the county, does it have water possibilities? Do you have sewer possibilities? Meaning you don't have to put a septic system, you don't have to put wells. Can you just hook it right up there? Um, sometimes the county will pay for this stuff. Sometimes they'll pay for it, sometimes they won't. I was in a development meeting with a guy who um, two years previously, he has a 50 acre piece of land, two years previously, the county came to him and said, look, we're running water and sewer near your area. Do you want us to do it for you? 
it, you would only pay for the cost of the larger size of the pipe. That's all we'd ask you to pay. And it was like, I don't know, let's just say it was like $20,000 or something like that. If you pay for this, we'll get you water and sewer access to this future development that you'll probably have one day. And he said, no, it's not worth it. I don't want to do it. Two years later, this guy's trying to develop the land now. And they're saying it's like $300,000 to get him water and sewer access. So really it killed that potential because he didn't do it earlier, but the county was willing to subsidize a lot of the cost at that point. So that's an important thing to know. Economic studies, you know, it's important to know, like, will, will an area support, you know, what you want to develop or, you know, what's the rate of, uh, are these homes are selling in the area. What's the, um, days on mark what's the days on market what's the months of inventory not understanding all this stuff so that you don't put up a development of 50 lots and there's not enough people to buy them right is that is the economy growing in that area understanding the zoning laws right understanding what the county requires you to do for uh a development right you need to understand does that do that so this is all these things you can be doing for a feasibility study Division rights. Okay. The question is, will the local government allow property to be split and in what ways will it allow it? You would think like, well, you got to, let's say you have a 50 acre piece of land. Well, of course uh, the local government would say, yeah, you can split that and turn it into a development that looks like this one in the picture. But that's not always the case. One of the first questions they ask is, is it a parent tract, right? So a parent tract is a piece of property that the, that the smaller parcel was once a part of. So if you're looking at a 50 acre parcel, what, what was the parent tract, right? Was it part of a 200 acre parcel at once? Was it part of a 75 acre parcel and then 50 was cut off? Or is the 50 acre parcel a parent tract? And basically the way I understand this is, I'll take Goochland for instance. There was a time in Goochland when I want to say in like the 70s or 80s, they did, you know, mass surveying and zoning of all that the, basically all the land that they had and all the parcels in the county. And they said, and they named parent tracks. They said, this is a parent track. This is a parent track. This is a parent track. And then they made rules for the parent tracks. And the rules are different things from, you know, you can only cut it up so many times, right? You can only cut, break it off so many times breaks you can only break it up into so many parcels right and you have to understand these laws and these in the zoning in order to understand if you can do something now you can get things rezoned which which you know let's say the 50 acre piece was already cut off of a 100 acre piece and you can't cut it up anymore per the current zoning what you have to do is go to the county go through the long rezoning process it can take six months it can take a year and uh, you know, cut it up. Now, obviously, it's much easier if it is a parent tract and the county allows some kind of division, right? If it allows some kind of division and has division rights. So, one of the questions you could ask when you're looking for a piece of land, and, and this can be true if uh, you got a residential buyer who's just like, I mean, all the time you come across people say, "I just want to buy ten acres and uh, cut off two five-acre lots, build one a house for my parents and one for me," right? People say that all the time. What I found that in most developed areas like Goochland, as, as they're grown in development and other areas, these, these 10 acre pieces are not parent tracks and they cannot be cut again, right? They cannot be cut. But one thing you can ask the seller's agent, if they even know, or the owners maybe know, is this a parent track and does it have division rights without rezoning it? Now, sometimes, yes, it does. You might find a rare case, you find a 10 acre lot, it's not in a subdivision. It hasn't been cut up. It's been like that for 50 years and the county will allow you to do one cut, cut it right down the middle, do five and five. Now that's very valuable, right? So a, a parcel that's 10 acres that you can cut into two pieces is going to be more valuable than a parcel beside it that's 10 acres that you can't cut in two pieces. Because remember the, the rule of bulk purchasing, you can sell those five acre lots for more total than you can sell the 10 acre by itself. So, you know, I had a, had a client ask me a question the other day, if I bought this parcel next to me, should I just abandon the lot line, make it one big parcel? I said, no, do not do that because you're going to devalue your property. Keep it as a separate parcel. 
because once you've banded that line, it's a lot harder to go back the other way because you're going to be more valuable having two parcels versus one big one. But you have to understand, understand division rights, understand the parent track. All right, so, all right. Um, Can under, I ask you a question? The cost, the profit, and, uh, you know, what, what your person is looking for. Now, this is just kind of like a basic rule that someone told me about, but, you know, um, this, isn't, this isn't a hard, fast rule, but you can kind of use it as just like a quick sketch to understand how to make money and how developers try to make money in development, okay? So what you can shoot for is a third of the cost, a third of your money goes into the development, and then a third of it is profit, right? So in other words, just breaking it down very simply, and this is a very lofty goal, actually. This is a high-end goal. So let's say you pay $100,000 for a piece of land. Let's say you put $100,000 into developing it, and then you want to make $100,000 profit after selling it all off, right? That's kind of just a general rule, but that's, that's, a, that's a lofty goal, right? That's just a quick analysis that you can kind of like – figure out. Now, if you have a $500,000 piece of land, maybe it's $500,000 to develop and so on and so forth. Now, again, these can go up or down, but that basically what that means is it's a 50% profit. So, cause the, the developer has put in 200 K right for acquisition and development. And then they're hoping to make hundred K off their 200 K investment. Now, but that might take two years, it might take three years, four years, who knows? Um, but realistically, if you do research, 25% profit would be a good goal. So in this case, $50,000 profit would be a pretty good goal, right? So again, it's important to understand your client's goals. If they're saying, hey, I want to put 200000 into a development and I want to make 200000 profit, you have to probably manage their expectations a little bit and help them understand that they're new to this thing. Now, if they're not and they understand it, you probably don't have to have those goals. Okay. Acquisition costs, okay. So the acquisition costs are obviously the obvious things. Land price, what the land costs you. So the cheaper you can get the land, the better profits you can get for your client, right? This goes with anything, buying anything. When you're buying and selling something, the cheaper you can purchase it for than where your profits are. So, of course, your taxes, uh, taxes and purchasing it, Um commissions that they may pay you directly or whatever it might be. It's ultimately it's built into the price uh, title and closing cost fees, just like any other thing. And then the feasibility studies that we talked about earlier, um, you know, rainwater, where does the water go? Like when you, when you develop a piece of land, the county's going to want to know, okay, yes, you're going to build 50 houses on here and you're going to move the dirt and you're going to make the swells move the sweat you know the sway of the land where the water runs you're going to change that stuff so the question is where's the water going to go is it going to puddle in one place is it going to funnel all down to the neighbor's house next door and create a creek behind their house i mean these things are important to know again environmental soil work surveyors um traffic understanding the traffic uh you know do you have to have a um an exit lane a lot of you guys know um about uh, subdivision that I was, I had a house in and uh, basically what happened was it was developed, the market crashed and they didn't finish the roads. They didn't fit. They didn't finish the exit lane or the entrance lane into the neighborhood. So the County wouldn't take over the roads until that was finished. That was one of the things that had to be finished. So, um, you know, if, if it's depending on how busy the road is, how much traffic, how fast you go down that road, you may have to have an exit lane. Again, this is development or this, this could be acquisition cost. Te technically, that's, um, technically, that's development cost. Line of sight, um, doing a study with VDOT um, and understanding, you know, for instance, okay, so when you're pulling out of this development, can you see, how far can you see to your left and to your right? VDOT won't approve a development unless you can see far enough in either direction, depending on the speed of the road. <laughs> now, I know this is, maybe a little bit more complicated, but this is, this is many of the things that they have to understand, right? Um, there's lots of other stuff in your acquisition costs. Okay. Development costs, right? Okay. So you may have done surveys in advance. You may have done a preliminary survey, but ultimately you have to do a completed survey and record the plat with the County before you can have an approved subdivision. Right. Um, and then of course the land construction, land construction, meaning like, the movement of the dirt. Are you taking out trees? Are you, 
um, you know, clearing lots or you flattening areas so you can put a house there, right? That's why you need this huge equipment to come in and, and do this stuff. This is some of your most expensive costs right here. Road development, extremely expensive. Um, you can talk to Nathan Wiley about that. He's uh, paving the road in um, the development he's got. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, it's crazy to pave these, pave the road. Do you need it to be paved? Some uh, some zonings don't require it to be paved. If you have a fewer number of homes, they, some counties will say all you need is a gravel road. If you hit that threshold, then you need to be paved, and all of a sudden your costs go way up, right? But then hopefully your lot costs increase along with it. Um, again, getting water and sewer to the property, the cost of that. Common areas, are you going to have a common area? Are you going to have a pond? Are you going to have you know an area where there's a pavilion and people can come? Um, it, because these types of things, you know, attract buyers, attract homeowners to the area, right? They cost money, but they can increase your price on the lot sales. And then proffers. Proffers is, is, is essentially a tax you pay to the county uh, as you're developing the neighborhood. So what the justification is, is that the county will say, okay, you're going to put 50 homes over here. So that's going to increase our costs. We're going to need to hire X number of teachers for schools. We're going to need X number more police officers. We're going to need, you know, different, better infrastructure for our county in whatever ways. And so what they'll say is on each lot you sell, you got to pay us a certain amount of proffers. Now, this can range. It really, it doesn't, there's no like real hard dollar figure of what proffers can be, but it can be a couple thousand bucks. It can be 20,000 plus. I mean, it can be a lot more per lot. And what you have to understand is this is good for you guys to know just in residential. If you're buying a lot in a neighborhood, if your client is buying a lot privately in a neighborhood and they're going to build a house, you need to know and ask if there are proffers on the lot. Some neighborhoods have them, some do not. But because what happens is you your client buys a lot and then when they go to file the building permit, all of a sudden the county says, whoop, all right, cool. We'll approve this building permit, but you need to pay us a twenty thousand dollar proffer. And then what happens to their their budget? You know, it's gone. And this stuff happens, guys. This stuff happens all the time, just because agents don't understand what this stuff is. You have to understand this. You have to look for that. Um, there is a little place on the MLS that indicates if there's, I think they call it development fee or something like that. But do the research. If your client's buying something, don't take that word for it. Call the county. Get a zoning official on the phone and say, are there proffers on this? But this is part of the development cost that a builder, uh, the developer may have to pay. They may have to pay this if they're involved in building the lots. And you got to calculate that into your costs and your profits. All right. So big question you should ask is who's going to buy and build on the lots, right? Who's going to buy and build on it? Is it going to be a separate builder? A lot of developers say, I don't want to get into construction. I don't want to swing a hammer. I don't want to manage a construction site. I just want to buy the land, cut it up, and sell it to, to a builder. Sometimes they'll put, they'll take one builder, right? Like, um, you know, for instance, there's a, there's a neighborhood on uh, Fairgrounds Road called Lanes Inn. The developer said they bought this 100 acres with their cash. They developed it, surveyed it, cut it up. And they basically reserved all of the lots for one single builder, Main Street Homes, right? And Main Street probably gave a promise to sell X number of these within a certain amount of time. Um, it's usually how it works. And then every time they sell a lot, the developer gets paid. Boom, 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 boom. You know, there's 50 lots in there, so it gets paid on every every one. Sometimes they'll they'll reserve lots for you know two or three approved builders, right? They want a certain type of builder of a certain caliber. You look at um, Breeze Hill right next to that one in Goochland. The developer, actually it's the same developer, bought the land. He said, I'm going to just only allow these two builders at first, like two or three. And uh, because he wanted them to be of high quality, he wanted to have control over it. He wanted to make sure the first several homes built in there looked nice. And so he said, I'm reserving these 10 lots for each builder. you got to sell them within this amount of time. And, and build on them. And then so what happens is when they sell a lot, they buy it from the developer, he gets paid, boom, 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 boom. That's how move on. they move on. And then maybe your client wants to build. Maybe they're a builder. Um, 
and they that's how they make their money. But you really should separate these things when you're doing your analysis, separate the land development and profit there and then the building as a separate cost, separate profit. I believe that's what you have to do. And then maybe they're doing they're going to sell it to private individuals, right? Maybe they just want to put it on the open public market and sell it to private individuals. Okay, so the pros and cons of I'll start with that one is you're not going to get a consistently built product, right? When somebody develops a neighborhood, why, the reason you have HOAs and covenants and rules is so you have consistency. So you don't have somebody coming in there building a pink house and raising pigs and killing everybody else's value. And it's, you know, cheap construction or whatever it is, right? So that's the, you know, that's the cons of, of private individuals. But the pros might be that you can unload it quicker because you're opening it up to the whole public, right? So your client, the pros and cons, um, you know, the, the, the pros are that they could make more money at it, right? They could make more money building it. The cons might be that they can't build it fast enough to keep up with demand, right? A lot, that's why a lot of times why they get a, a couple different builders in there and then, you know, selling it to a separate builder. Again, the pro is you can, you can unload it a little quicker than yourself. You, you hand it over to a company that's that's their expertise, that's what they do, and they're going to, you know, build and sell the property, sell the lots. You know, the cons are you don't make as much because you're not have a hand in building. All right, that's pretty much it. That's that's what I got for you guys, and that was a relatively quick one. Do you guys have any questions, comments on any of this stuff? Yes, I do. Okay. I tried to ask it, but then I felt like I was interrupting you, so I typed it out, so I didn't forget it. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm having no, 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 you're fine. Maybe I just figure maybe now we'll do these where like you don't interrupt, and then we can ask questions. I typed mine too. Good job, Ashley. Our um, both of us are very good at that. Okay, okay. So mine was, how do you find out if it's a parent tract? You might have said it, but maybe I wasn't listening clearly enough. Like, do you just rely on the selling agent, or is it on MLS, or? Do you have to check with the county? Like, how do you find out if it is a parent tract so that you know you can't split it up anymore? Yeah, the best way to do is to check with the county. I mean, the the, the, the most sure way. Uh, I would say probably more than 50% of um, agents who are selling a piece of land don't under... I mean, I would just venture to say that. I could be wrong, but right. don't understand or wouldn't know if it was or wasn't. Right. They may tell you, and they may tell you wrong. They may be misinformed, so... It's a very big deal. So when you're doing studies for the property, you need to confirm that with the county zoning people. Okay. So you just ask the county, because I have like, I have a, a person that's zoning for what I was doing with my house with Powhatan. So you would just go to like whatever county it is and be like, hey, yep. what is this zone? Or is this a, do you just ask them? Like, how do you? Yeah. So know? so they'll they'll pull up the, the GIS site and actually okay. you can do it yourself. So I'm, that's I'm what going, I was wondering too. Can I just yeah. look it up on GIS? Yeah, it's it's a little complicated to look up, but I'm gonna see if I can figure this out because okay. I've done it before. Um I don't have anyone right here. now, but just curious uh, for the future. I said I don't have anyone right now, so you don't have to rush, but just curious for like the future if I ever get one. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, all right, let me pull up my screen again. Uh, let's see, present. All right. Well, I have Can you all see my screen? Almost. Yeah. All right. So this is this is just our property. I'm just pulling it up as an example. So over here on the left, mm -hmm. it's it, right now I have clicked parcels. I can unclick that and it doesn't show it. But then I click parent parcel labels. Well, parent parcels. So the purple mm. is a parent parcel. Okay. So, and then if you, again, if you look at it, so this is my neighborhood right here. So this, um, this purple section was a parent tract because it was, a, you know, basically deemed that a long time ago. But now this is six lots in Walnut Ridge. So what it looks like these days is here. So it, it parent parcel was cut up and these are not parent tracks. Obviously the parent tract is this 60 acre piece. And then um, we had the, we own this piece behind us, which is a parent parcel. The survey I have on this one was 18, like 1890 something. It's really amazing mm. hand drawn like survey. Um, so this piece has been like this for a really, really long time. The 17 acres. I mean, at least, uh, you know, hundred some years um, but over here, at least on the Goochland one, you can see parent parcels right here. Um, 
So uh, I thought you said you can't split up parent tracks, or was I wrong? You can't re-split it you, up. You, you can't. You can't. Uh, you can split them up, but they have to be rezoned. You have to go to the county get get permission. So, this piece, this piece right here, I think per the county rules, without the county approval, I could cut off five acre pieces. So it's seventeen acres. I could get three lots out of that right there, um, without getting going to the county zoning and getting approval in a six to twelve month process. But you, but. Um, you technically could uh, cut a piece that's not a parent parcel, but you have to go through zoning. But most likely they wouldn't approve certain things. I mean, they're not going to approve cutting these lots in here in my neighborhood because they've already been cut and it's a, it's a subdivision. It would devalue everything around it. If I just said, hey, I want to cut off a couple acres right here and build a house, for one, the neighborhood probably covenants would prevent, uh, would prevent that. But um, So the answer to your question is yes, you can, but... If it's a parent parcel, you don't need permission. And so, oh, oh, okay. So, yeah. like, once the parent parcel or parent tract is split up, you really can't really split it up. Yeah, Got yeah, it. Without, without the county approval. Okay. Any other questions? Somebody said they had a question in the chat. Let me see. Nance, are you raising your hand? <laughs> you two used to third grade. You're 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 muted. If you want to say something. You're muted. Here we go. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, okay. So I have a land piece, uh, a property and in, uh, in the, and it says on the, okay. On the Goochland website, there's a house that's for sale. 717 Mannequin Road. My client wants that, but he also wants to possibly put an, a. Uh, um, a, a contract on the six acres that's also attached to it. It's only for sale for the person that 717 mannequin. But there's no information. Like the lady's like, okay, go ahead and submit a contract. I'm like, I don't, I don't have the parcel number. I don't have anything. I don't know anything about it. And he's like, they're asking 160 for it. Cause they're saying, I think she says that that was the assessed value. And then to, yeah, yesterday she said it was just appraised in Jan in December. I'm like, so I know appraised and assessed is different. Yeah. If, but is it very different appraised and assessed different when it comes to land? Yes. Th they, the two really have no relation to each other. They should hypothetically, but they like the assessed value <coughs> is supposed to be, uh, you know, indicative of fair market value, but but it's delayed. It's usually six to twelve months behind, um, and it's also think about this. So you've got, let's say in Goochland, there's, um, I don't know, let let's say there's three or four county assessors that work for the county, and their job is to put a value on things so they can get tax money. I mean, that's their job. And then there's, nobody asks them any questions, and whatever they say always goes. The best well, generally, ever. you can challenge it. You Which can challenge it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm not, I'm actually th this year. I've actually was appointed to the board where when people challenge it, I'll I'll get to see what their challenges are. It's pretty pretty interesting to watch. But you can challenge it, and and uh, you know, and if you have a good case, you can say my assessment's way too high. I shouldn't be this paying this much taxes. Now again, getting my point, you have three or four assessors. You literally have thousands if not like 10,000 parcels right in, in in a county that these three or four people have to put values on so they're just putting sweeping values on things like they're like all right this area we're going to go up four percent this area we're going to go up ten percent this you know what i'm saying so they're not looking at every single thing an appraiser is going to get much more detailed get down to the nitty-gritty and figure out what it's worth now you can do what an appraiser does if you just uh, do the market research, I mean, if you feel confident, but if you don't feel confident, then that's when you want to hire an appraiser to do stuff. I'm trying to see if I can pull this one up, but the, the website's kind of like crashing right now. I know I can't find. So my client wants to know if 160 is a good price for this land, and I'm like, I don't know. I I can't find the number. I don't even. I mean, I know where it's located based on. I can see it. Can you search um, comps in the vicinity? Well, I want to know like what 
the GIS says, what the numbers are like on the, it's not on the MLS. It's not for sale. Correct. So and I says for sale by owner. No, it's yeah, but it's not, it's only for sale for the person who buys the house that's on the land next to it. Okay. I don't know why this is not working. So that's what I'm just trying to, she's like, so write a contract on it. And I'm like, I don't know yeah. anything about it. I don't know the numbers on it. I don't know. Is anyone able to pull up this site? Because it's not working for me for some reason. Okay, that's what it wasn't working for me either. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Goose and GIS. It was just working a second ago, but now it's not. I can search for it on the map. Let's see here. This is frustrating. Yeah, see if you can do the map search with the address. So Mannequin Road is... I'm sorry, this is probably very personal, so I don't want to take up everybody's oh, it's good. It's a good lesson. So what do you, so Mannequin Road, I think is right here. 717. So you just find the parcel wherever, ugh, find wherever it is. And then, and then, but, but what you can do, Rachel, is take the zip code and just say, find other six acre parcels in that zip code. Okay. So I found the land, the property, like the actual property. I have the tax parcel ID for that. It's six three one one zero a five a. So I thought maybe if I found that one, I could find the one next to it through yeah. this. But I don't. I can't figure that out. Uh, yeah, you can search the parcels right here. But right now, the site is just spinning. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can talk about this later. Yeah. So it says land market value. If so you know. If you know the name of the people that own the land, you can look it up in the tax records. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, okay. Their names are? To so go in the, into Realist Tax and look up their, the owner's name and it'll show you all the property they own. And Daniel can disagree with me if he wants, but basically anytime somebody brings up assessed value, I'm like, that number is garbage. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But what does mean something? So they just said they, they just had it appraised. Should I? Should I ask? That's different that? than what Kat just said. The assessment that the county does, like Daniel said, it's very general. They don't know any details about a piece of land or a house when they're putting that number on there just for taxes. The appraisal might mean something if the appraiser used good comps. <laughs> Yeah, so the appraisal, they just had an appraisal done, supposedly. So I should ask the agent for those copies, correct? Oh, yeah. If they would show the appraisal, that would help you for sure. Yeah. Am I allowed to ask for that? I mean, if we're going to buy it, they're, they're offering it for sale. They said it's 160 because that's what the appraisal said, but I have no proof of that. Ask for the appraisal, and then also you might look at the comps on that appraisal and be like, these aren't good comps. The house, the land shouldn't be worth 160 Okay. But that's very different from an assessment. Okay, that's what I was wondering. I just didn't know if it was, I knew it was different for houses and land. I didn't know if it was, because I'm like, how much, how much is there different? Like, it's a piece of land with nothing on it. Like, I'm like, so it's one thing if it's in a neighborhood and all the pieces of land are the same because they've all been, like, it's a Ryan home situation, something like that. But, like, especially in more rural areas, one piece of land that's right next to each other can be so drastically different. Like, there was a piece of land that we had looked at a while ago, and it was this beautiful eight-acre piece, but it needed a $20,000 driveway. So that land's not worth the same as the piece next to it that doesn't need a $20,000 driveway. Here it is. Can y'all see my screen? It finally worked. So I guess this is the house. And this is probably the six acres. Yeah, 6.5 acres. This, this is all house is actually not on the 6.5 acres? Correct. Okay, good. So do you think it's worth 160? And that's what I... This is really interesting. It actually borders two roads. You see Mannequin Road and Hockett Road right here. I'm trying to get the most challenging negotiation negotiator to buy this property. That's a good location. There is a great piece of land. Oh my gosh. Who does not take that as 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 an actual evidence? I need I need you guys to give me words that are true with documents. Do a market analysis. I mean, just yeah. like you would do a house. There are gonna be other pieces. I mean 
I know what I'm going to do. How your kids? They're young. You want to wait to buy this land? Your kids will be grown and it'll be worthless. Why don't you do it when they're young and you can make trails and play with them? So when you're old, you have no, no one to share it with. That's my that's my my new argument. <laughs> okay. Hey man, doesn't matter okay. what you are. The piece of property across on six twenty one long term is going to be developed into a subdivision. So potentially, it would be a good investment. Really? How do you know that? No. If you go to the Goochland County zoning site, they'll tell you all the future developments. Um, and I used to do work for the people that own the big piece of land on the other side of 621. Do you know these people? Got, the Bradleys, are they famous in Goochland? I know the name, but I don't know them personally. Okay. But I say that big track on the other side is just really crappy round, so they kind of put it on hold because they're going to have to do so much, but eventually they do want to subdivide it more. All right, so I just pulled. I don't know if you can see my screen, Nance. I mean, this this is this shows you how vastly different land can be. So I just said three to six acres in these in this zip code. You're looking at fifty one thousand for a three acre, up to three sixty five for a four acre. Obviously, this is in the meadows, so it's a high, nice subdivision. Okay. So what you're looking at is not subdivision. So I'd break it down to these. So you're still within the fifty to one. 45 range uh, but that's for three acres three acres Ooh, that's so great but here's yeah i mean these are all three acre pieces so to me 160 for six acres is probably pretty good so you're looking at a high end of these at 145 that's i mean that's just how you that's how you do it try to narrow it down and find the best comps devon way that's close by that's in a subdivision. Auburn Chase. I just think land is so hard. It scares me because I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I feel like what people value is different. Like this one man. Sure. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, that's very true. On it. I'm like, why? Oh, because some they people want woods. Some people want pasture. Some people want close to things. Some people want far away from things. Some people want it to park. Some people don't care because they're never going to develop it. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So I think, I mean, just quick glance, 160 is probably a pretty good price. Okay. You got them selling for 140 at three acres. <laughs> right. So. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Any other questions on this stuff? I have one more, but it's yeah. really quick. Um, about proffers. So, like, Magnolia Green out in Chesterfield, <clears throat> the developer. This is like a really, maybe it's a bad example, but basically developer, the first developer went under yeah, and then whoever took over it, right? So whoever yeah. took over it charged the people that live there proffers. Can you do that? Or can I be like, I mean, I don't have a person, but like, can I say <clears throat> future, <clears throat> sorry, my allergy is really bad. You there? Who's here on their phone? Can you mute your phone for like two seconds? Oh, please? it's probably me. Hold on. It's me. No, I don't think it's you. It was someone like on there. No, like on there. Okay, they did it. It's just as like, yeah, it just as like 804 or something. It wasn't you, Nance. Um, so like, can you say, all right, my client, land buyer, man or girl, you can charge the builders a proffer. Or can you not do that? Like, is that, should you just pay it up front and be done with it? Yeah. I mean, essentially you can get the builder to pay it. Or you can just say, I'm going to make my offer based on knowing I have to pay it. Oh, um, okay. Now, the one in Magnolia Green is a very interesting point. This is just kind of a whole side subject. But because that development went down, the county took it over, and they, they put it what's called a special assessment uh -huh. on that whole subdivision for every lot. And so every lot has to pay, I don't remember what it was, but like. I think it's like $1,200 or something. Okay. Or so, it's, either, it's either a 12 or a six, but they let them do it over the course of like two years. They can be on a payment plan. Yeah. 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 So, well, some of it's more than that. I'm pretty sure. I've heard yeah. Like, 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 I think, I think, 
So, so what you could do is you could, when you're representing the purchaser, you need to let them know that if you're buying a Magnolia Green, you have this special assessment, and you can ask the seller to pay it up front on your behalf. You can say, hey, you have this assessment at closing. I want you to pay the county the $1,500, whatever it is going to be uh, on my behalf. I, I mean, I've seen it as much as $7,000. Like I thought yeah, it was. I've seen like uh, really, really, really high ones. But I remember, yeah. I just remember one specific one because I was selling at Harper's and we got the client because we told her, we were like, you don't have to pay this stupid tax that the developer messed up on. And we got that. Yeah, but exactly. um, I don't remember what it was. $1,200 could be like super low. I have no idea. Yeah, so, yeah. So what was the answer again? So you can. So in the special assessment case, you can ask the seller to pay for it if you're buying a, you know, in your case, Ryan Holmes was there just like, we'll cover it for you. We'll pay it. We'll pay it up front. Right. Then, they did. And then they yeah, made yeah, yeah. every person that financed, they would be like, okay, this is what you pay extra in taxes. And people were like, wait, why? Yeah. Okay. So, so guess, they pass that cost along to the buyer then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was like a really field. bad example. I was just curious. Like, no, no, it's a good example. It's good to know about Magnolia Green. On the, on the private side, sometimes the seller pays for that fee. Sometimes the buyer pays for it. Sometimes the buyer doesn't know it until they move in. All of a sudden they get this yeah. $30 tax every month that they didn't know they're going to have for the next five years. And okay. it sucks. Yeah. Some of them were like super high. But anyways, I think Laura said she had a question too. I just read that. I do. And this is like, I mean, I, it still kind of goes along with what you were talking about, but it's kind of specific. So if you've got somebody who already has the land, but they want to hire um, a surveyor to come out and subdivide, you know, I don't know if subdivide is even the right word, but, you know, split the land up. I mean, I guess that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Um. I'm sure that cost, depending on the parcel and how much you want to split it up, probably varies, right? But oh, sure. so what is like a general, like if somebody, let's say somebody has like a 50 acre piece of land and they want to split it into two pieces or they want to split a small piece off from that piece of land, mm. how much can you expect to pay a surveyor? Oh man. So they, they usually charge per hour and it's like $125 per hour. I don't know, sometimes less, sometimes more. And um, it just depends on the linear feet that you're doing, you know? So if you're like, if you're splitting off one acre, I mean, that's relatively less linear feet than if you're splitting off 20 acres, you're, you're talking about 20 times the cost. So um, I mean, you're, you're talking in the, in, if you're talking, I mean, if you're if you're just saying like getting 50 acres and cutting one division of off of 50 acres, you might be a couple thousand bucks, something like that. I had so what's, what's the process? Do you um, go to like you have to go to the courthouse and have? I mean, how so does yeah, that? So work? Basically, what would happen is if let's say if it's a parent tract, you really don't have to do much. You get the surveyor, they come out there, they flag it, they draw a new plat, and you record it at the county. The county stamps it, and you're good. If it's not a parent track, meaning it it's not approved to be cut at that right. as it sits, you still get the surveyor to come out there, draw it up, and say this is what we propose, and then you go to the county zoning and planning people, and you have to go through all these meetings and boards and all that stuff, and tell them what you're doing, why you're doing it, what the plan is, and it goes, you know, this person approves, this person approves, this person approves. They put it out there. They'll, they'll put a sign out there. You'll see those signs that'll say zoning rezoning in process um you know and then the neighbors can object they have so much time to object to it it's, it's a lot of red tape and then finally you know a year later they might stamp and say okay we'll allow you to to cut this up gotcha um, so it's so if if it's not a parent tract uh -huh. <clears throat> it can be like it's gonna take i mean what what's the typical amount of time you would say and I'm sure that varies too, depending on county and like. If it's not a fair track, I mean, you can get it, get all that stuff cut up in a month. <laughs> you surveys and recordings and all that stuff. Yeah. If it is a parent track. I'm sorry. If it is a parent track. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah. If it okay. is a parent track. Um, I was going to tell you, so I had a guy, uh, let's see, he bought 40 acres. He, it was four parcels, 
and he had it all surveyed, and it was like, I think it was like four thousand, four or five thousand dollars. That just gives you a general, a general idea. Now there were big tracks. Like if he cut up two acre parcels on forty acres, you're probably looking more like ten or fifteen thousand dollars. You know, mm -hmm. so, something like what that. What if somebody has? I've got because I've gotten for some reason I've gotten a lot of questions about this lately, and I think it's just because. People want to know, and even just like regular single family home buyers, the land is not marked even in a neighborhood, their property no. isn't marked, and they want to know exactly where their property is before they purchase the home. And then, you know, the 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 thing to do, I know, is just to, to ask, you can ask the, you know, you can request the agent, get you a plat map, and if they don't have it, you can get it from the courthouse. Is there a, is there going to ever be a case? where if, if something is not necessarily in like a big neighborhood where for some reason the the plat map that the county has is not going to be accurate or it's going to be out of date or anything like that yeah so there's a couple things to know so if you're asking you get a plat from somebody just receiving the plat doesn't tell your average person where the line is unless you have specific uh marker like, like there's a field and a tree yeah. line or whatever right so actually getting a surveyor to physically go out there and flag it that's really what clients want to know that i've discovered so two sides of this when you're helping a buyer if they want to know where the property lines are you want to hire a, a, a surveyor to go out and mark the lines they don't have to draw a whole new plat they don't have to that's a whole nother cost and expense just get them to get a surveyor out there just to go flag this flag, flag this line, hit this corner, find this pin, and then they know what they're buying. On the other side of this, if you're helping a seller, Laura, you bring up an excellent point because if you're helping a seller sell a piece of land, people want to know what they're buying. It's like when you right. go into a house, when you go into a condo here in West Broad Village, you know what you're buying. You see it. You can physically touch it. You know where your property line is. It's very clear. If you're in a neighborhood, it's very clear. you got a fence, blah, blah, blah. But if you're buying something that's one, two, four, five plus acres with a house or no house or whatever, people want to know where, what am I buying? Where is my piece here? And, yeah. you know, there's a guy uh, in, in Goochland. He's married a cousin of mine, Frankie Carter. Some of you guys know him. Anyway, so he used to make money by flipping land. And this is what he told me they did. He said they go and they buy a piece of land. One, they might cut it up, sell it off smart little pieces. But he said the thing they would do is just cut a perimeter trail around the property. Let's say it's 10 acres, sell it and make profit. Just because people wouldn't buy it for as much before because they didn't know what they were buying. They didn't know where the perimeter was. They couldn't envision it, right? It's kind of like staging. It's the reason we stage a house is because people can't really envision that. It's hard for them to envision what they're buying, and they can't tell because they don't know where the lines are. So if you're helping a seller, I always tell them to flag the lines if it's reasonable just to know where people are so people know what they're buying. So for something simple like that, even if it is in a neighborhood or if it's a, you know, it, say it's a four acre piece of property that comes with a house is I do have several people right now who every time we go to look at a house, they're like, yeah, I would definitely want to know where the property lines are. And I'm like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah so yeah. would they, I mean, they basically, first of all, when would that happen? Because like, what if they don't want to buy the property? without having the lines marked. Based on line, you know? yeah. So this is a real, real <laughs> good point. Is Betsy still on here? I just had this comment with Betsy. Yeah, I think she's here. So so for instance, her, her client wanted to know, hey Betsy, her client wanted to know like where the property lines were on this on this parcel. So um, you know, <laughs> our advice is if it if the property lines are could be a deal breaker to you, you need to make the contract contingent on being satisfied with the property line. So in other words, I always use the words, if purchaser is unsatisfied and then finish the phrase with whatever, that's like a get out of jail free card. So if purchaser is unsatisfied with the location of the property lines during the, you know, during the inspection period, the purchaser may terminate and be refunded full deposit. So if Perfect. that's important to your client, you need to make that in the contract. Cause I'm telling you, I've made this mistake. People buy a house, they buy a piece of land. They think the line is here and they find out later it's not. And it's our fault because we didn't advise them correctly. Yeah. 
That's exactly what I was looking for. And so is that going to be a little less expensive than what we just talked about with? Yeah, just just I mean, you're talking about a few acres and just flagging a couple lines. I mean, you're talking to, you know, a few hundred bucks, maybe 500 bucks, 600 bucks, something like that. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Yeah, because I, I know I'm going to like I've got a couple showings today on some larger pieces, you know, that come with a house. And I yeah. know they're going to ask that. Yeah. So that's perfect. Yeah, and of course, the bigger the lot, 10 acres would be more. You might be, you know, $700 right. or something like that. Gotcha. Thank you. So yeah. If you're buying a lot, this is so helpful. Um, so, for example, with this one, it has a house and a lot, and he wants to possibly buy the house, the lot next door, which is for sale by the same owners. They have the appraisal done. It doesn't has never had any testing perk test on it. Yeah. Appraisal says they're making a grand assumption that it does perk because oh, yeah. next door does perk. And I guess the other ones near it perk, but they can't guarantee that. So if the land does not perk, that would bring the value of the land down significantly. Correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. Maybe so 20 I would, grand. I would definitely advise my client, even if he's not, planning to ever build a house on it to actually get it tested. Oh, yeah. Always, always advised to do as many feasibility studies as possible. The biggest ones are soil study and a potential survey. So they understand what they're buying, but also um, could a, could a house be built on this parcel? So the survey is means could a house be built on this parcel or the survey is just the edges? Two, it could be mean both because a survey could indicate to you that the lot is too narrow to build a house or you have to build a very skinny house. For instance, there's setback rules. So setbacks mean you have to build a house X number of feet from a property line. You have to, and they're usually different from the front to the okay. side to the back of the parcel. Um, you can only build, you know, let's just say from the front, it's, you got to build at least 50 feet off the road from the side it has to be 20 feet from the side. And now, so, so that's a 40 foot buffer. Now, if your if your lot is 50 feet wide, you can build a 10 foot wide house, right? Um, that kind of stuff happens. And that's a lot of times why you see these skinny houses because of, because of setback. Oh, rules. okay. Yeah. But, but that's I love those conversations. Not, it's not it's so bad. Helpful. Me too, Laura, me too. Cause it is like so uncomfortable. If you don't know, you're just like. <laughs> and, and Jason will tell you that on Hockett Road there, there's a lot of bad soil around there. There's a lot of, um, I guess it's getting close to like the Tuckahoe Creek Swamp, or maybe that's what it is, I don't know, but um, a lot of those places require alternative systems. So you so definitely what do you think? Right. What yeah. do you think? Do you think, it, do you think it'll perk or do you not? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, it could be 50-50. I don't know. It's probably better than 50-50, but you will, you do find some along Hockey Road. So one part of that parcel is Mannequin, the other side is Hockett. Yeah. So have bordering, but which is really interesting. It probably probably gives it a little more value in some ways, I would think, because you can enter from each road. I just know that Hockey Road, there's several places that have alternative systems. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sounds good. Mr. Dukas recorded it. Is he? I guess he's gone. Wait, where did he go? It's being recorded. I guess it'll stop when we all leave. All right. <laughs> Sounds good, guys. I got hand sanitizer here, so come grab some. If you wow. it, there's a few more pieces. Thank uh, you so much. This one's free. Next one's twenty dollars a bottle. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. That's Ben's advice. All right. Sounds good. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Peace. Bye, Laura. Adios.